Hello everyone, I'm Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to The Grim Curriculum. A very quick thank you to all of you for making our Catherine Knight episode one of our most successful launches yet. In fact, the most successful yes. launch yet. Yes, absolutely. Thank you guys so much. We are very glad that we could share her absolutely terrible story with all of you. You guys really seem to like the uh, killer ladies. Yes. And because of that, or maybe in spite of that, we are sharing the story of another killer lady. We are covering an American case this week, and it's our first one in quite a while. Today we're going to be talking about Carla Faye Tucker. Carla Faye Tucker was a woman whose life was filled with drugs, alcohol, and partying. On June 13th, 1983, Carla Faye Tucker, along with her boyfriend at the time, killed two people with a pickaxe, and she later shocked the world with her conversion to Christianity and claims by multiple people that she had been reformed. Her story raises a very important question. Should a death sentence be commuted to life in prison if the person has changed for the better in a dramatic way? If the system is designed to rehabilitate people, then what happens when it works? What if family members of the victim speak out against the execution? In the end, Carla Faye Tucker was killed by the state of Texas, but her story sparked a moral debate throughout the world. But before we can get into all of that, we need to start where we always do, the beginning. Carla Faye Tucker was born in Houston, Texas on November 18, 1959 to Larry and Carolyn Tucker. She was the youngest of three sisters. Her father worked as a longshoreman, which is someone who loads and unloads ships. All in all, the very early part of her life seemed to be pretty uneventful and even happy. She spoke a lot about her parents and her upbringing, and up until very close to her execution, she blamed her mother for a lot of the things that she did. And some of you may agree that her mother was to blame at least a little bit, but we're going to get to that pretty soon. Carla started smoking and drinking at a very early age. Her sisters weren't the best influences, and when she was eight years old, she caught them smoking marijuana and she threatened to tell their mother. Her sisters had her smoke some of it so that if she told, she would get into trouble too. Great role models. Well, and I even remember, like, smacking my sister as a kid and then be like, oh, you can hit me back, you can hit me back, <laughs> so that we wouldn't get in trouble. But, like, when you're eight and already smoking pot... Not off to a very ugh. good start, Carla. But overall, they were a fairly happy family, and they did things like fishing and water skiing together. But that didn't last. Larry and Carolyn Tucker would fight a lot, and that eventually led to them splitting up when Carla was 10. During the process of what was a very painful divorce, Carla found out something about herself that she did not know. Larry Tucker was not her real father. Carla was born as the result of an affair. Yikes. So she found this out when she was 10. After this, her father was not really involved in her life. It was also around the age of 10 that Carla used heroin for the first time. So big jump there. Yes, and it only gets worse. By the time Carla was only 12 years old, she was actively doing drugs and drinking. It was at this point she began having sex. Carla's sisters weren't the only ones who were a bad influence on her life. It sounds like she was just surrounded by them. Arguably, her mother was one of the worst. Carolyn Tucker was a groupie, and by the time Carla was 14 years old, she would join her mother. Not only would she join her, her mother actually took her out one evening to a party where there were a lot of grown men and women. It was there that her mother would teach her how to sell her body like she did. Carla and her mother would go on to tour with various bands such as the Marshall Tucker Band, the Allman Brothers Band, and most notably, the Eagles. Carla's sisters would also become involved in prostitution, and all three would have relations with much older men. And all this by the time she was 14 years old. Carla's childhood was over pretty quickly. Her life consisted of partying, which of course included drugs, alcohol, and sex. Carla's sisters eventually became involved with men who were in a biker club. One evening, a man on a motorcycle came to their house looking for her sisters. When he saw that they were not there, he asked her if she wanted to shoot some heroin with him, and he took her away on his motorcycle. Like you do. Right? <laughs> just, just like you do with 14-year-olds. Yeah, like a normal Tuesday evening. No yeah. Deal. Carla admitted later in an interview that she fully believed that at the time the man was going to hurt her very badly. Like, she completely believed that she was going to be molested, oh and she God. was like, Kate. Hey, Luckily, though, that didn't happen. What he did, though, was give her heroin, and a lot of it. He injected her with heroin until she was incredibly ill, and then he just dropped her off at some apartments. By the time she was in the seventh grade, Carla had dropped out of school. She said regarding this, I got kicked out as much as quit. At this time, Carla wanted to be just like her mother. She enjoyed the unrestricted life that she lived with her, and generally had little to no adult supervision. So at this point, she's 14 years old, zero adult supervision, no longer in school, actively using drugs and alcohol, and having, I guess, lots of sex. Ugh. Awful. When Carla was 16 years old, she met a mechanic named Stephen Griffith. 
When asked about the night they met, Stephen responded, I was 19 years old. I had a Harley Davidson, worked six months a year, and made $20,000. I thought I was on top of the world. Me and a bunch of buddies pulled into a local park. We were hanging out and partying. Carla Faye and one of her friends were over there smoking a fat pink joint. I hollered over and introduced myself. That's how we met. The two married about a year later. The marriage was not a happy one. The couple would often fight. And we don't mean like yelling matches. They would throw punches at each other. And the fights got very physical. Stephen would later say that Carla would hit him harder than any man ever would. Which is pretty remarkable considering they were both, one, still very young. Yes. And two, she's not a big lady. No. She's not a Catherine Knight by no. any means. She would even protect him at the bar when other men would try to fight him. She really was a regular old Catherine Knight in that sense, wasn't she? Beware the women who love their bar fights. And men for that matter. Just don't get into bar fights, friends. Don't do it. The couple joined a motorcycle club and they would collect guns for fun. They also enjoyed playing rough matches of tackle football without any protective gear. So romantic. Very. (laughs) Steven, he had his own fair share of substance abuse problems and the relationship was clearly a very toxic one for both of them, but they still seemed to love each other very much. Stephen described her by saying, That girl had so much potential. She could talk to anyone and make them feel at ease. She was charismatic. Even when she was on drugs and could hardly walk, she was beautiful. Despite their fights, he still described her as a good wife and said that she took care of him. She would cook his meals, make sure he was ready for work, and she kept a clean house. One day, Carla announced to Stephen that she was leaving him because she wanted to work on her wild streak. He was devastated, but also horrified. He fully believed, and he told his friends this, that she would either kill somebody someday, or she would be killed herself. Her mother passed away when Carla was 20 years old. Carla spent much of her early 20s partying and hanging out with bikers, as well as touring with various bands as a groupie. Around this time, she met a woman named Sean Dean and her husband, Jerry Lynn Dean, and when she was 21 years old, she met Daniel Ryan Garrett, Danny, as his friends called him. He was 35 at the time. The four would become pretty good friends, and they spent a lot of time partying and hanging out with each other. Something interesting to note was that it seemed like Sean and Carla got along really well, and I guess they would have, but Carla did not get along with Sean's husband, Jerry. The two would fight, and it would often get physical. Once during a fight, Carla kicked him out of her house because he wheeled his motorcycle into the middle of her apartment. He made a huge mess and he dripped oil everywhere, all while filling the apartment in exhaust fumes. Which I think is fair. I would be pretty frickin' mad if someone brought their motorcycle into my house. It reminds me of that episode of The Simpsons. It's a really old episode, but Marge gets, like, taken away by a biker gang. But at one point of the episode, they're all in The Simpsons' house and they're, like, partying and, like, trashing it. And I just picture, like, Carla Faye Tucker in the middle of this with The Simpsons. I, I can picture it. On another occasion, Carla punched him in the eye. It was well known that the two really didn't get along. She even told a mutual friend named James Lee Brandt that she was angry at Jerry and she wanted to intimidate him, steal his bike, and then kill him. This is seriously a recurring theme for us on this podcast. It's honestly shocking how many people just go around announcing that they're going to kill someone before they do it. Right? It's honestly bizarre. Like, not to, like, encourage any bad behavior, but, like, if you're going to do a crime tell as few people as possible about it. And it goes on the flip side. If you're like chilling with your friend one day and she's like, I hate that guy. I want to steal his bike and kill him. Maybe keep an eye on her at the very least. At the very least. At the very most, perhaps call somebody, law enforcement preferably, but like, yeah. But I guess in their case, they're all doing drugs. You know, to call the police on someone would, would basically be to call the police on yourself. The police weren't their, like, BFFs by any means. No, But for still, sure. if your friend is running around saying he's gonna kill a guy, maybe tell him. And also, kill a guy that they're supposed to all be, like, best friends with. Mmm, that's a good point, too. Right? On June 11th, 1983, Carla and her friends were celebrating her sister's birthday. The celebration was a weekend-long party filled with heroin, cocaine, and other drugs. They all sat around the entire weekend and just got higher and higher. Along with them were Danny Garrett and James LeBrant. So, by June 13th, two days later, Carla had already consumed a huge amount of drugs and alcohol. She decided that she was going to steal Jerry Dean's house keys. Jerry Dean and Sean didn't think much about the missing keys. They just assumed they were lost. Court reports say that Carla had convinced them that they had lost their keys. Between 2.30 a.m. and 4.30 a.m., Carla Faye Tucker, along with Danny and James, went to Jerry's apartment. 
She was pretty messed up at this point, but she was able to walk and carry on a conversation. She told him that she wanted to scare Jerry and get some money from him that he owed her. They had a plan to take items of his if he couldn't pay. They planned to take his TV, a stereo, and his motorcycle. They entered the apartment while James went to look for Jerry's El Camino. Carla and Danny went into Jerry's bedroom and Carla sat on him to pin him down. In an effort to defend himself, Jerry grabbed Carla above the elbows. Danny intervened when he saw this and he began to hit Jerry on the head with a hammer that he found on the floor. After he finished hitting Jerry, he left the room so he could carry some motorcycle parts they were going to steal out of the apartment. Carla had stayed in the room with him. Jerry was still alive, but the attack had caused his head to become unhinged from his neck and his lungs and breathing passageways filled with fluid. This caused him to start making a gurgling sound. Carla, upon hearing this, got upset and wanted Jerry to stop him from making that noise. She then attacked him with a three-foot pickaxe that had been standing up against the wall. Danny walked back into the room and struck Jerry one last time, killing him. He left the bedroom to continue loading up the motorcycle parts. Carla was left alone in the bedroom again, or so she thought. It was at this point that she noticed that there was a woman hiding under the bed covers against the wall. This woman was Deborah Thornton, who had met Jerry earlier that day. Deborah had gotten into an argument with her husband the day before and went to the party where the two met. She had spent the night in Jerry's bed. Jerry had been killed while Deborah was in the room. The lights had been on and she had heard the attackers' names. Not wanting to leave a witness, they decided to kill her too. She initially grazed her shoulder with the pickaxe and the two began to struggle. Danny separated them when he saw what was happening. Carla began to strike Deborah with the pickaxe and eventually embedded it into her heart. Shockingly enough, Carla would later state that with every blow of the pickaxe, she experienced sexual gratification. She told this to numerous friends and would later testify in court confirming it. Like, that is vile. <sighs> so vile. Yeah, oh that's Lord. rough. Now, at one point, James LeBrant walked in and he saw all of this. He heard a gurgling noise and entered the bedroom. He testified that Carla pulled the pickaxe out of one of the bodies, looked at him, smiled, and then continued to hit her victim again and again. I mean, we'll get into it, but you can see why people were not so keen to believe that she converted to Christianity. Exactly. He left and he walked around for an hour before calling a friend to pick him up. Carla and Danny were furious at him for leaving, but James offered to help them dispose of the El Camino as an apology. I would imagine that he was probably scared shitless by Carla after seeing her demolish someone with a pickaxe. Can you imagine just like walking into a room, seeing this wild biker chick you know hitting someone with a pickaxe, and then her just like turning around and smiling at you? No. You, I think at no, that no, no, point no, no, no. in time you'd be like, yeah, no, didn't sign up for this. After the murders, they stole Jerry's truck, wallet, and motorcycle and stored it at Danny's brother's house. The morning after, Carla showed up at Danny's brother's house. Douglas Garrett, or Doug as he preferred to be called, was shocked when she told him that they had killed Jerry the night before. She told him that Danny hit him in the head with the hammer and even told him about the sexual gratification that she felt. Poor guy. Can you imagine your brother rocks up to your house asking you for a favor and then Carla Faye comes around, shows up, and starts talking about pickaxe orgasms? Good band name. It is. It really is. I like it. Oh, man. She gave him Jerry's wallet, which Doug burned in an ashtray immediately. Doug initially refused to store the stolen motorcycle parts, but he eventually changed his mind. A co-worker of Jerry's discovered the bodies after Jerry did not arrive to pick him up for work that morning. The co-worker, Gregory Traver, found Jerry's body in the bedroom along with the body of Deborah, who still had the pickaxe stuck in her chest. They openly bragged about the murder for over a month before they were caught. According to friends, they came across as very excited about the entire thing. Examination of the bodies showed 28 wounds on Jerry, 20 of which were severe enough to have been fatal on their own, and this is along with the skull being fractured. Deborah was stabbed multiple times in the back and chest. In the end, two people ended up going to the police. One of them was Danny's brother, Doug, and the other was one of Carla's sisters. Doug was given a hidden mic and was set to have a conversation with Carla and Danny about the murder in an effort to obtain information for the police. He was able to obtain 90 minutes of them talking about the murder. Carla Faye Tucker and Danny Garrett were arrested soon after, and in September of 1983, they were both officially charged for the murders. Carla and Danny were tried separately, and Carla agreed to testify against Danny in exchange for the murder charge of Deborah Thornton to be dropped. 
Sadly, Danny would also never be charged with the murder of Deborah Thornton. So Deborah, I feel like she really got the shit end with the oh stick my with god! This. You know, like talk about like wrong place, wrong time. Um, believe it or not, um, she originally pled not guilty at the suggestion of her lawyers. It was during this time that Carla took a Bible from the prison ministry program and began to read it while she was waiting for her trial to start. It was then that everything that Carla believed in would change. In an interview, she said, I didn't know what I was reading, and before I knew it, I was just, I was in the middle of my floor, on my knees, and I was just asking God to forgive me. Carla would wholeheartedly embrace Christianity until her death. The defense argued that Carla was not in the right state of mind during the attacks, and that she was now expressing great remorse for what she had done. And we'll remind you here that she and Danny were going around for five weeks, five bragging, weeks. bragging to everybody they could about what they did. So do with that information what you will. They also argued that Carla didn't have a criminal history. Yes, she had a history of violence, but she never really broke the law. When Carla took the stand, she talked about her difficult childhood. The prosecution brought up her many fights, and they were well aware about the fact that Carla very openly disliked Jerry. Like we mentioned before, the two had gotten into numerous physical altercations. She once hit him so hard in the face that his glasses broke, and he had to go to the hospital to have a piece of glass removed from his eye. Oh my god. That's awful. Yeah. They also pointed out that, yes, Carla showed remorse, but it was not until after she was arrested. She still spent five weeks beforehand celebrating it. To me, at least at this point, it makes me think that she is not sad, she is not remorseful, she's just sad she got caught. It's an oh shit moment. Exactly. Carla's sister stated that she had heard Carla and Danny talking about killing James LeBron and his friend who had picked him up in order to keep them quiet too. After she was sentenced, Carla confirmed that she did say this, meaning she had possibly intended to double her victim count. Carla even talked about future plans that she had with Danny. The two wanted to break into drug labs, kill the workers there, and steal from them. Carla's history of violence and willingness to engage in dangerous activities really didn't help her case. You know, this just made me think of, um, I feel like it's called, there's a movie called Nikita, and it came out probably in the late 80s, early 90s, and it's kind of this, it's about this druggie that breaks into a pharmacy and accidentally ends up killing someone, she gets put under for the lethal injection, but like the flip is she doesn't actually die and they like recruit her into this like assassin program for the government. Ooh. It very much has like the beginning very rings true to Carla. So I, and they were around the same time. Interesting. I wonder if they were inspired. And then it definitely didn't go that way for Carla. She didn't no. get to be a secret agent. No, no, she didn't. She got to meet the Lord. The question that was then brought up was whether or not the killings were the result of robbery or if the robbery was just an afterthought to the killings. Did they go in with the intention to rob them and things got out of hand or did they want to kill them and then the robbery was just a bonus for them? Exactly. And she admitted that her intention was very much to kill him and the property was just an afterthought. On April 19th, 1984, Carla Faye Tucker was found guilty of capital murder and was sentenced to death by lethal injection. This was, and still is, a huge deal. It is very rare for women to receive death sentences. In fact, Carla was the second woman executed in the U.S. since 1976. Danny Garrett was also sentenced to death, but he died in 1993 of liver disease while waiting for a retrial. Carla was sent to the Mountain View Unit in Gatesville, Texas, where she was set to spend the rest of her life on death row. Carla also stopped blaming her mother for what she had done. She stated, I no longer try to lay the blame on my mother or on society. I don't blame drugs either. When I share that I was out of it on drugs the night that I brutally murdered two different people, I fully realized that I made the choice to do those drugs. Had I chosen to not do the drugs, there would be two people still alive today. But I did choose to do the drugs and I did lose it and two people are dead because of me. She talked about how she wanted to be just like her mother and had wanted to make her proud. According to the Houston Chronicle, in 1983, there were 556 homicides, but barely any of them received media coverage. The murders of Jerry Dean and Deborah Thornton were heavily covered, and a big part of that was Carla herself. Her face was all over papers, and she caught the attention of many different notable figures. By this time, Carla had fully converted to Christianity. She argued that she wanted to spend her life in prison doing good things for other people and helping them. She said that she wanted to serve as an inspiration and wanted to show that she was a changed woman. 
Certainly, you can't say that brutally murdering two people is good. It's not, said Tucker to ABC News' Dean Reynolds. But afterwards, what came from that in me was good. And this brings up the really big question that we're going to try and share opinions on at the end of the episode. If someone commits a terrible crime and is reformed, should the sentence be lessened, especially a death sentence? Right away, she began to appeal her sentence. Carla agreed that she was guilty. Despite the fact that she originally pled not guilty, she never actually claimed that she didn't commit the murders. She applied for various appeals throughout 1987 and 1992. She also argued that she should not be sentenced because she was under the influence of drugs when the murders had taken place. She said that she was a reformed person and she did not expect to ever go free, just that she did not believe she should die. Her pleas drew the attention from several people, including the United Nations Commissioner on Summary and Arbitrary Executions, Pope John Paul II, the World Council of Churches, the Italian Prime Minister. And we, so like, we mean it when we say that she drew attention from people all around the world. Also, Newt Gingrich, <laughs> televangelist Pat Robertson, and shockingly enough, Ronald Carlson, who was the brother of her victim, Deborah Thornton. That's the one person I never would have expected to be. I was very surprised that, and we'll talk more about him a little bit later, totally. but he was very adamant that he did not believe Carla Faye Tucker should be executed. In 1995, Carla met and married prison minister and car salesman Dana Lane Brown. He would adamantly support her and he believed that she was reformed. The couple were married behind prison glass, never allowing to touch. They would remain married for the rest of Carla's life. Carla would spend a total of 14 years on death row. At this point, even the warden agreed that she was a model inmate and that she had likely changed for the better. It shouldn't be a surprise to any of you that the media ate oh, this case big up. time. At this point, Carla Faye Tucker was being talked about on an international level. And we do want to share a snippet of a news article from the Houston Chronicles. This is an amazing example of the kind of reporting that was being done about her. Charlotte, are you ready I'm, to bless I'm us with ready, this? I'm ready, I'm ready. Right. Conjure the image, an attractive 38-year-old woman is strapped to a gurney in Texas's execution chamber, her dark, shoulder-length curls splayed across the antiseptic white sheet that covers the hard, cold deathbed. Her charcoal-colored eyes are transfixed ethereally while she utters her final entreaty to the god who she says miraculously transformed her in jail. As a lethal cocktail pumps through her veins, she may involuntarily arch upwards, straining against the leather straps, and gasp or cough a couple of times before her final breath is expelled in a matter of seconds. That's intense. That's so intense. Oh my and god. this is just... This, she hasn't been executed at this point. No! They're just speculating about what the image of her is going to look like. Which I, I'm a very morbid person. Obviously, we have a true crime podcast. Yes, hello. But that's a bit much, it's don't so, you think? It's so bizarre. Like, to me, we were talking about this before we started recording, and, like, to me, this reads almost like fan fiction. It, it does. It's so intense yeah. and so, like, bizarre that if you showed me the statement and you made me guess if it was real, I would assume that it wasn't. Because it sounds like it was written by, like, a middle school child with a thesaurus. It really does. And say what you will about Carla, whether or not you believe she should have been executed or not, that is, like, that's pure sensationalism of something yes. that should not have been sensationalized. And I have to point this out because this just occurred to me. Conjure the image, unattractive. So they right away they're, talk about... Yeah, they're yeah, painting this picture, yeah. I want to point out that when we were recording our Jane Tobin series, all they talked about was how unattractive and she was. how homely she yes. was. Yes, and then we have Carla Faye Tucker, where they just, like, her talking about her curls and her charcoal-colored eyes. and They're almost painting her as, like, this, like, angelic Very figure. much so. Yeah, and it's very, like, very. You can see they're starting to already form this narrative. Yes. And yes. we're going to really see that happen oh, in a little bit. very Absolutely. much so. Her husband, Dana Brown, was even interviewed by Larry King about his wife. When Larry King asked him about meeting Carla, he said, She's just a special lady, and I think last night you saw that for yourself. She's just a special lady that not many people have gotten an opportunity to meet. When he was asked how he felt about the fact that even in a best-case scenario, Carla would never get out of jail, he responded, I think that would be fantastic. I think she deserves to live, and she is reaching people right now, Larry. She has been reaching people for 14 and a half years from a 6 by 9 cell, more than those of us reach on the outside. 
Carla was also interviewed by Larry King and talked about her faith and her history of being a model inmate. She talked about how if there is a change for the positive within a person that was able to be proven that the court should consider that when looking at a death sentence. Unfortunately, all of that didn't matter. The board continued to reject her appeals and Carla Faye Tucker was still sentenced to be executed by the state despite pleas from all around the world. On January 20th, 1998, Carla wrote a letter to Governor George W. Bush and the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles to plead her case. We have a few excerpts from her letter to him that we'd like to share with you. I am in no way attempting to minimize the brutality of my crime. It obviously was very, very horrible and I do take full responsibility for what happened. I also know that justice and law demand my life for the two innocent lives I brutally murdered that night. If my execution is the only thing, the final act that can fulfill the demand for restitution and justice, then I accept it. I will pay the price for what I did in any way our law demands. She also talked about wanting to send money to Deborah's family for someone to go to school in an effort to make things right. She was told not to by Deborah's husband. She did go on to say, 14 years ago, I was part of the problem. Now I am part of the solution. I have purpose to do right for the last 14 years, not because I am in prison, but because my God demands this of me. I know right from wrong and I must do right. I feel that if I were still in here in the frame of mind I got arrested in, still acting out and fighting and hurting others and not caring or trying to do good, I feel you would consider that against me. I don't really understand why you can't or won't consider my change for the good in my favor. She went on to say, I am seeking you to commute my sentence and allow me to pay society back by helping others. I can't bring back the lives I took, but I can, if I am allowed, help save lives. That is the only real restitution I can give. On February 2nd, 1998, which was the evening of her execution, George Bush rejected her request to have her sentence changed to life in prison. On February 3rd, the U.S. Supreme Court considered her petition for her stay of execution, but they denied their request and approved for her to be executed later that day. Over the course of her final days, a camera crew followed a team of people who were trying to get her sentence commuted. In these videos, you can really see that people were incredibly attached to Carla. At this point, they considered her a friend. We want to point out that this isn't like everyone wanted the execution stopped. Many people argued that what Carla did was horrible and she should pay the ultimate price. Among them was the husband of Deborah Thornton. He stated he was sick and tired of the way Carla was being depicted and called her Miss Saint. He had every right to hate Carla. In fact, the entire ordeal was horrible for him even after the murders. He was barely included in the trial process and was not regularly informed when things were happening. He stated that he felt incredibly disrespected by the system. He talked about it in detail in an interview where he said, I was unable to find out anything. I was not made to feel like I was part of anything that was going on. When Carla Faye Tucker and Daniel Garrett were finally arrested and charged with the murder of Jerry Aldean and my wife, Deborah Ruth Davis Thornton, I was made to feel like an outsider, someone who had absolutely no bearing on the incident. I could not believe it. I could not get anyone to even tell me when the trial was. Everything that I learned about the case was what I learned through media. There was no one who was advising me as to what was going on or what would happen next. I felt like I was further down on the list than the criminals themselves. This poor, poor oh man. God. Like, that's just awful. And remember, all of this happened after him and his wife had fought. Like, he still loved her very, very much. I, my heart genuinely breaks for him. Yeah. Because I think that is a nightmare. If you've got a loved one, whether that's a husband, a wife, or mm -hmm. a partner, or whatever, or even a family member or a friend, you would, it would be the worst case scenario where you had a fight and then you couldn't make out because they passed away especially, for whatever yeah. reason. Especially like, if oh. they were brutally murdered. Yes. And like you it's... might feel responsible for that, right? Because like, mm -hmm. if, you know, you guys fought, she went to a party to blow some steam off. What if you hadn't fought? Exactly. It's, like, it's oh. on, like, I feel so bad for this man, and then to be completely disrespected totally. by the system like this, well, like, it's just... they weren't even charged with her murder. Exactly. So... That's just it. Yeah. Like, that, I feel like, for him, he <sighs> is just a, a huge victim here. Yeah, it's, absolutely. And, and it's remembering stuff like this that really, like, I'm not, I don't feel bad for Carla at this point. She's I, not a I, victim. I, no. I'm going to be straight up about that. That's my personal point of view here. Yeah. But um, I feel like 
I, I think about what she did, and then I think about the fact that she basically got away with one of the murders. I, I definitely, I flip-flop. Uh, to me, execution, capital punishment is a very gray area. In this case, there was no doubt about what Carla did. She yeah. killed two people. There was evidence. She admitted it. She talked about it. End of story. Like, you, know, you know what I wondered, though, is if she had been actually charged with two murders, would people have been as willing to defend her? Hmm. And th- that's actually very true. I'm surprised that based on how the papers sensationalized her and made her out to be this beautiful woman that was in jail and about to have her life taken away, they really focus on the fact that she killed the man in the mm-hmm. situation. I'm surprised they didn't pick up and be like, no, she killed a woman. You know, because they yeah. were sensationalizing everything. I wonder why they didn't do that. Yeah, it's it's really bizarre. And it, honestly, the whole thing just makes me feel so, so bad for him because it's it's just horrible. Yeah. Absolutely awful. Carla did a lot of interviews prior to her execution. She spoke a lot about religion, and she pled for her sentence to be changed. Pat Robertson, who spent five years trying to have her sentence changed, stated that despite the fact that he was a huge believer in the death penalty, he did not think that Carla should be killed. He stated that he believed that she was totally reformed and that executing her would not be justice, but vengeance. She was flown to the Huntsville unit in Huntsville on February 2nd, where she was set to be executed the following day. On her final day, Carla was said to be at peace. She was given her last meal, which consisted of a banana, a peach, and a garden salad with ranch dressing. She did not eat any of it. She wrote a letter and was allowed two visits. She spent some time with her husband, Dana. They were given about half an hour together. After that, she spent another half an hour with a spiritual advisor. There were two last-minute calls for clemency that were denied, and George Bush called for the execution to go ahead as planned. He stated, I have concluded judgments about the heart and soul of an individual on death row are best left to a higher authority. It's literally your job, George Bush. Like, that's <laughs> the one thing about that, st- I get what he's saying, but it's like, mm, and, I think and everyone's decided it's up to you, sir. From the little bit that I was reading, because you always see it in movies where it's like, we need to get to the governor. They're the only person that can pardon the person on death row. And it comes down to the last minute. But that's actually not the case. The governor has a big say in it, but he still has to go by the rules of like, um... Forgive me, I, for, well, I forget they, they what they have ex- standards that they exactly. have to, you know, that they have to yeah. look at before they execute And even somebody. if the governor's like, no, I don't think this person should be executed, there's still, like, a, I don't want to call them a council, but a committee of people that's like, no, George. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. No, you can't do that. And he did state, like, he basically said, like, you know what, I forgive her for what she did, but we're still going to execute her, though. Exactly, yeah. Carla selected five people to witness the execution. Her sister Carrie, her husband Dana Brown, and her friend Jackie Onchkin, and Ronald Carlson. Ronald Carlson had originally supported the death penalty, but after meeting Carla on death row, he converted to Christianity, and he was very against it. And if you remember, Ronald was Deborah's brother. Exactly, yeah. Along with them were Richard Thornton, his son, his stepdaughter, as well as various members of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, the warden, and a few members of the media. Sometime shortly after 6.30 p.m., Carla changed into fresh white prison clothing. She got onto the gurney on her own, and her body and legs were strapped onto it. Her arms were then strapped to the sideboards, and an IV was inserted into each of her arms. At 6.35 p.m., she was taken to the execution room. She was then asked if she had a final statement. She said, Yes, sir. I would like to say thank you to all of you, the Thornton family and Jerry Dean's family, that I am so sorry. I hope God will give you peace with this. Carla turned to her husband, Dana, and said, Baby, I love you. Everyone has been so good to me. I love you all very much. I'm going to be face to face with Jesus now. Warden Baggett, thank you so much. You have been so good to me. I love all of you very much. I will see you when you get here. I will wait for you. She then closed her eyes and appeared to pray silently before looking up at the ceiling. At 6.37 p.m., she was injected with a cocktail of three drugs, sodium theopental, panocurium bromide, bromide, and potassium chloride. Witnesses reported that within two minutes, Carla let out two deep sighs and then an audible groan. Eight minutes later, she was pronounced dead with her eyes still wide open, staring at the ceiling. And so with all that, that newspaper article was not very far off as to what actually happened. Yeah, you're actually right. Yeah. I will say one thing, that if I was in a situation where, like, I had my fate in the hands of other people like she did, Mm -hmm. I would not want George Bush (laughs) 
<laughs> to be the one responsible for deciding whether I live or die. No. Oh. I hadn't even really thought about it that way, but like if 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 my lawyers came to me and was like, Charlotte, this is your last like last uh, string that can possibly pull you to safety, I'd be like, you know what, it's okay, don't waste that man's time, because it's just not worth it. Like, it's it's not gonna do me any favors. I, I mean, really, though, like, it's just, he's... Like, picture... I want everyone listening. Like, picture his face. Picture George Bush's face right now, and imagine that is who decides whether you live or die right here, right now. I'm not feeling good about it. I'm feeling horrible about it. <laughs> <laughs> After Carla Faye Tucker was executed, many people spoke out against what had happened. Conservative commentator Tucker Carlson criticized George Bush for his statements and ultimate decision to not grant her clemency, which, like, if you've seen Tucker Carlson on Fox News, as I'm sure we all have, yeah. no matter if you're Republic- Republican or Democrat, Christian, liberal, I think we all know who Ca- Tucker Carlson is. It's pretty wild that he would be like, yeah, George. You went too far. Too far, George. I thought that surprised me too, actually. Yeah. Um, In 2004, a movie was released about Carla Faye Tucker called Forevermore, which is about the redemption of Carla. It is very well loved by religious groups who use Carla as somewhat of a success story to this day. They claim that if she can find God and become better, anyone can. In 2011, Fred Allen, who managed over 120 executions, was interviewed by Werner Herzog for his documentary, Into the Abyss. He talked about how he suffered an emotional breakdown, left his job, gave up his pension, and is now against the death penalty. Dang. When talking about Carla Faye, he spoke about how easy it is just to change laws and how no person has the right to take another life, no matter the circumstances. The death penalty is an incredibly complicated yep. moral debate that we're going to talk about more and more throughout this podcast. But this brings us to some questions for all of you. So let's look at some of the other women that we've covered. We've got Mary Bell, we've got Catherine Knight, Jolly Jane, etc. They all did terrible things, but they didn't show any remorse at any point. They were also able to live their lives afterwards. Mary Bell now lives in anonymity. Catherine Knight is having a whale of a time in jail. And Jolly Jane died at the ripe old age of 81. Mind you, not all of them lived in places where a death sentence was the option, but if they were able to live out their lives, should Carla Faye Tucker have been able to live out her life? Especially if she actually did reform herself? On the flip side, what if we switched things up and looked at this case from a point of view that the murderer was a man? Would her co-defendant have been spared if he hadn't died while awaiting trial? Was Carla Faye Tucker looked at differently because she was a woman? I think so. Yeah, if you have gotten this far and you don't think that by now, Start at the beginning and just re-listen to the whole thing because you weren't paying attention. Carla Faye Tucker was absolutely treated differently because she was a woman. Because she was an attractive woman. Because she was a white woman. Yep. It worked in her favor. Think of all the other people that have ever been executed. The majority of them are male, to be fair. Huge. Throughout history. But so many of them have found religion in prison. Yep. Yep. They still got executed. Very few of them were ever granted clemency. And I think, quite frankly, if some of them would have been like, hey, I found religion, everyone would have been like, great, good for you. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. I hope you say your prayers before you see the final beyond. That's exactly it. I think that she was given a lot of sympathy. Um, but I also think that she was used as like this the poster child. Oh, big yeah. time. And and if you even like, if you look at videos of her and you go into like the comment section, the amount of like very, very religious people. Yes. And, and I don't mean just like p- religious people. I mean like hardcore religious people, the stuff that they comment and the way that they still look at her is, is bizarre. They very much, um, put her on a pedestal yes, in some ways. Yes, very idealized. kind of made, like, a, a martyr of her, yes, really. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But, like I said, again, think of a man in her situation, a man that's killed two people brutally with a pickaxe, high has as, like, yeah, high as yeah. balls on every drug yeah. going, and then said that they experienced sexual gratification while doing so. And with then, every blow of the axe. Yes, yeah. They would not have been... No one would have even been allowed in their cell to speak to them. They wouldn't have entertained it, I no, don't think. No, not at all. Let us know what you guys think in the yeah. comments if you can. Or email us at thegrimcurriculum at gmail.com. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts, Charlotte? Well, I mean... Yeah. Whew, this is... I mean, this is a very, very different kind of case to look at. I, I Like I said before, and I've, I'll say it again, I do... The death penalty capital punishment is such a tough one. 
I go back and forth. And we want to just remind you guys really quick, we are Canadian. Yes. We do not have We don't have that here. Like, it's not an option here. No, and it's not been an option for a very, very... Has it ever been an option in Canada? You know what? Pause. I'm going to Google it, and we'll come back and let you know. BRB. We're back. Okay, we're back. Okay. So, we we did some Googling. So, Canada's last hangings were carried out in December of 1962, but they didn't actually uh, abolish the death penalty until 1976. And then it says here, in 1987, there was a government motion to reinstate it, but the principle was defeated. So, um... Even, it says, the death penalty for military service offenses under the National Defense Act was abolished in 1999, so we have not had an execution since 1962, so it hasn't been legal for quite some time. Very long time. Um, But still, like, it's just, it's not something that we deal with here, so I I think about, like, how many people really do get executed in the States every year, and it's it's a lot, when I was looking into it, it was a lot more than I originally thought. Yes. And I feel like, why Carla? I, I think in a way they were probably trying to make um, a message of her, basically. Like, just because you're a little lady that get you're not getting away with it. Yeah. Like, I think that was kind of the two sides of it. The, the, the side that did not want her to be killed, and then the side that was like, uh, no, she done did a bad, mm-hmm. and this is the punishment in Texas for that thing. Yeah. So... Yeah, I, I, the only place I get really weary of the death penalty is when uh, so often it happens where you find out later that the person that was executed did not do it. And I think, in my mind, if there's any doubt at all, it should be off the table. And I'm really glad that you said that, because that brings up a really good point, is it's like, Carla Faye Tucker admitted to this. Yes. She said she did it. She said she she liked it. We'll call yep. it what it is. She said that she liked it. She bragged about she it. She bragged about it. So it's not like, oh, well, we're not sure if she did this, so we shouldn't execute her. It's, she for sure did this. But is she reformed? Yes. And it's complicated. Well, honestly, it, I'm really curious to know what you guys think because it's, there's so many different ways to look at this and I'm genuinely curious, but uh, honestly, it's a very complicated issue. Like personally, I have a really difficult time believing in the death penalty for a large number of reasons that I'm sure we're eventually going to talk about. What I tried to ask myself while reading about Carla was if she was really reformed, that means in a way that the system worked, right? Yes. So the system is not just designed to punish, but also ideally make it so that people don't reoffend. I don't know if I think that she necessarily should have been executed, but should she have been spared? Like, what she did was horrific, but I look at so many other people who expressed absolutely no remorse and went free, and that really makes me think. I personally think that life in prison with no parole is appropriate in a lot of cases, and I don't by any means agree with what she did or even feel bad for her. I just don't think that someone's fate should be left up to George Bush, literally ever. (laughs) It's so true. What just came to my mind, and this is from a very non-emotional standpoint, and by all means, like, um, correct me if I'm wrong or throw any statistics at me, because this is just me throwing it out there. Let's hear it. But if someone has been sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole, they're going to spend the rest of their life there. Mm -hmm. She was 38, so which means she's probably got a good 30 or 40 years left in her if everything goes well health-wise and whatnot. Yeah. The people of Texas are paying their taxes to essentially keep her alive. If she's going to spend the rest of her life in prison anyway, is it not cheaper to not have her around? That being said, I have also heard that executions are quite expensive, Very much so, yes. Now, here's what I think with all of that. The church would have looked after her if she had life in prison that's oh true. my god they yes. would have looked after her she yep. would have had you know like money in in the commissary she would have been looked after not to mention people who were there other women in the institution they they seemed to really care for her they seemed to find her inspiring she would lead um discussions and things like that and i think that if they did allow her to live she would have been someone who was looked after by the church as long as they were interested in her and she would have led groups and done that whole thing and i think she would have had like i wouldn't necessarily say the kind of Catherine knight experience in jail (laughs) where you know she gets whatever she wants but i think that uh she would have had an okay time I I think you're probably right there. Churches have money, and they would have been happy to spend it on her. 
I agree, especially if she was continuing to be her poster child. Oh, they would have had book deals yeah. and movies and all sorts of stuff. I mean, like there, there is a movie out they, there. Yeah, but they already did, and exactly. And I'm pretty sure yeah. it's on YouTube if you wanted to watch it. If you really do, yeah. I mean, it's. I, I really do think that if she had been allowed to live, she would have... Uh, she would have been just fine in yeah. jail. And that's the thing where it's just like, if you murder two people with a pickaxe, do you get to be just fine and in jail? Right? And it's, like, yeah, it's us. Yeah, it's a, definitely a philosophical question for the ages. I do want to know what you guys think, because we're coming at it from a very non-religious standpoint, Yes, too. we do need to mention I'm, that, I guess. Yeah, neither of us are religious. No, and so, I, and I was saying this to Dina before, too, is that, like, I have not found God. It, I'm assuming likely will not happen to me. So I don't understand what that kind of thing can change a person or how it makes you feel because I've never experienced that. Far be it for me to tell anybody that their experience was or was not real. Yeah. I did not experience it. So for all intents and purposes, maybe she was fully reformed. I think what might be a good um, litmus, litmus test for you guys listening is one you might have a different religious background to us, and so you might have a very different opinion. You can actually go check out the um, interviews that she did in her last few days on YouTube. They're there for you to watch. Um, and kind <laughs> they of they should come with a warning. The videos are they're tough to watch. Like they're it's very it's very heavily religious, and it's I I made it through a couple, and Charlotte yeah. made it a lot further. But it was just, like, it, it's almost difficult to watch. Yeah, and that's just because, to me, it's it's not something I was brought up with. It's not Yeah, it's bizarre to me. Like, it's Very strange. much so. But, yeah, we definitely, we want to know what you guys think. This was a whirlwind. It, it really it was. It really was. Uh, we hope this episode made you guys think. And uh, like we said, we really, really want to know your thoughts. Because I, it's important to hear opinions from all different backgrounds. It's it's good for us to, like, put our opinions out there. We're just two ladies with a podcast. Yeah, so, like, it's good to hear the opinions of people who are different than you. We talked about that earlier yeah, today, actually, how yeah. it's important to surround yourself with people who are totally. different than you because it's going to broaden your mindset. Yes, because sometimes when you are surrounded by very like-minded people for too long, you kind of become surrounded in your own little echo chamber and yep. so everything that you come across you're going to agree with of course you are so like it's important to talk to people with different religious views different political views and whatnot because yeah otherwise you kind of end up in your own echo chamber just being like i'm right yes you are yes i am exactly and that <laughs> just that just always ends great doesn't it, it always just totally always but anyway we hope you don't miss out on the Grim Curriculum news, so follow us on Instagram at The Grim Curriculum and Grim Curriculum on Twitter. You can also find us on social media. I'm Dina V on Twitch, Dina V IG on Instagram, and Dina V Tweets on Twitter. And I'm Ominous underscore Walrus on Twitter and Ominous Walrus on Instagram. Join us every Saturday for a new episode. We also do a live premiere on YouTube at 12 p.m. MST, so come hang out with us and discuss this case in real time. We would love to know your thoughts, and we would especially like to know what you guys thought about uh, little Miss Carla Faye Tucker. Indeed. Thanks, as always, for listening, you guys. This has been The, the Grim, Grim Curriculum. Curriculum.